series. Uh, we're very happy that you've joined us this evening. My name is Abigail Kahn, she, her, hers, and I'm the executive advisor to the Dean of Engineering. And while we're not all gathered in one place, I would like to begin by noting that the residential campus of UC Santa Cruz is located on the ancestral land of the Awaspa speaking Uipi tribe. Our Silicon Valley campus is located on the ancestral home of the Muwekwa Ohlone tribe. And while we're not gathered in one place, we acknowledge our locations. And I wanna thank the rest of the team that brings you diverse voices. Uh, my colleagues, Carmen Robinson, Lindy Boisvert, Adi Weinstein and Melissa Baker. And I would also like to thank our associate, Jody Crutchfield, who will be providing the closed captioning for tonight's event. Uh, we're also joined by Alex Wolf, Dean of the Baskin School of Engineering. So welcome to Alex. And before I introduce our very special guest, I have just a few technical notes. If you've attended more of these, you've heard me say this before. Uh, we're hoping to have plenty of time for questions and we want to encourage you to post your questions in the chat. Um, uh, my colleague, Lindy Boisvert, will be monitoring the questions that come in and she, she will be reading them aloud uh, for Sheldon to answer. And no question is too basic or too out uh, or to off the wall. So whatever you're wondering, please ask it. Um, we want to really want you to feel comfortable asking whatever comes to mind. And as I mentioned before, the event is being closed captioned. Uh, so um, you can view the closed captioning uh, at the uh, using the closed caption button at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Okay, now to tonight's speaker. Um, Sheldon Logan joined Google eight years ago, and he's currently a senior software engineer there. In his current role, he works in technical infrastructure, including hard drive performance, health, and security, and I imagine some other areas. Um, Sheldon's also a photographer. He's the owner of Logan's World Photography, which he describes as a medium to display photos from around the world through the worldview of Sheldon P. Logan. Um, the photos are gorgeous, and I hope you'll, you'll check them out. Um, and that's not all. <laughs> Sheldon also teaches for the Baskin School of Engineering, most recently teaching um, our introductory course in computer programs and assembly language. Sheldon serves on the board of trustees for Harvey Mudd College, uh, and that is where he receives his Bachelor of Science in Engineering degree before he came to Baskin School of Engineering to complete a PhD in computer engineering. His dissertation here at, in computer engineering was entitled Thermal Aware Computer Aided Design CAD for Modern Integrated Circuits. And while he was here at Baskin Engineering, he was the recipient of the National Society of Black Engineers, a National Society of Black Engineers Scholarship in 2008. Uh, Sheldon is part of Google's summer mentoring program where he's had the opportunity to mentor nu numerous student interns. And I imagine he may be talking about that tonight. Sheldon, thank you so much for being part of the Baskin Engineering Diverse Voices series. Uh, we are really excited to hear about your journey from Jamaica to Google, from majority to minority. Take it away, Sheldon. Um, thanks for the kind words of introduction. Um, so as Abigail said, my name is Sheldon Logan, and uh, today my talk is going to be on my, from majority to minority, from Jamaica to Google. And this is basically describing my journey from being a part of an ethnic majority to being an ethnic minority and the challenges along the way. So to start off, um, I'm from this uh, small island in the Caribbean called Jamaica. Some of you guys might know it as the home of Bob Marley. That seems to be the most popular thing that people remembered when I was at UCSC, um, more recently also the home of Usain Bolt. Um, I was born and raised in Kingston, um, and I spent the first 18 years in Jamaica. So the first 18 years of my um, life in Jamaica, attending high school and elementary school in Jamaica, and the education system there is a slightly different than the way it is here. So you have to kind of declare the subjects you might want to partake in, in a university when you're 14. Um, so for me, I was always um, more interested in, in sciences than the arts. So I did chemistry and physics, but to kind of round myself up, I did um, history and geography at the O level. 
So Jamaica has a English-based educational system. Um, so you do five years of high school and then you take some exams and then you do two more years of high school called sixth form. And then you uh, take some more exams and then you, that's the entrance um, requirement for university. Um, so for me, to get into sixth form, which is a, what you do after the first five years, you have to do an interview. And in my interview, I was like, I wanted to be a rocket scientist because everyone else in you wants to be either a doctor or engineer or lawyer, which are very typical um, careers in, in Jamaica. But I was, I was kind of wanted to be slightly different from everyone. And so in, in sixth form, I did in math, physics, and chemistry. Those are the only three subjects I did. Um, and then I was contemplating whether I should continue school in the Caribbean, so go into University of West Indies, or decide to go to the US, which is was also pretty popular at that time. Um, in high school, I was interested in chemistry, and so I decided to go to Harry Mudd College in Southern California to pursue a degree in chemistry. I did one year of freshman chemistry and completely changed my mind in respect to my path because as some of you may know, chemistry is not the most fun thing. I'm sure chemistry majors will, might disagree with that, but I, um, after one year of chemistry, I decided to, to change my major to be an engineer. And that was a process elimination. Harvard Mudd College is a, is a technical school, so the only degrees offered are technical degrees and I didn't want to be a math major, physics major, chemistry major, computer science major, biology major. So by process elimination, I decided to be an engineer. And so I uh, decided to have a focus in electrical engineering with a focus on control systems. And so 2002, 2006 are good years in my life, college, everything's done after college, for all the people in, who are there now in college. Um, and so that was 2000, 2000, 2006, and I graduated from Harvey Mudd and was thinking about my next steps. And I decided to go to the University of California, Santa Cruz. Um, initially, I didn't really want to leave Southern California because Southern California was my first home away from Jamaica. But uh, Northern California has its benefits. So I've, I attended the University of Santa Cruz in 2006, and I'm still here. So even though my first love is Southern California, I guess something happened in Northern California while I'm still here. So I initially joined the Autonomous Systems Lab because I was more interested in control systems, autonomous systems. And within one year, just like in undergrad, I decided to change my focus. And I, um, I joined the VLSI CAD lab led by Matthew Guthaus, who still leads that lab. Um, so, as you can see, as I go through my path, you'll see that this is like a very constant change, constant thing where I decide I want to do something, I get to my next destination and then it's like, oh, well, maybe I don't really want to do this anymore. And so I, I joined the VLSI lab, VLSI CAD lab. I did a couple victory laps. So usually PhDs can be five years, six years. I was in grad school for seven years because it's not about uh, how quick you do it, it's about finishing. So there's nothing wrong with a victory lap here or there. Um, and as I progressed in, in my, I guess, academic career, I was going from 90% uh, population of, of Jamaica is black to Harvey Mudd and UCSC, where it's probably about 5% of the population were, uh, or uh, people that look like me. And then after seven years of grad school at UCSC, I decided to take a job at, at Google where 1% of the technical people looking like me to just 1% of the people that I encounter on a day-to-day -day basis looking at me. So again, um, Google is not necessarily the job I took at Google was not necessarily related to my research. Um, so this is another situation where after 10 years of school, I decided to just change path again. What really happened was my sister was like, I'd be an idiot if I didn't take the Google job. And so I just listened to my sister. Um, I actually initially accepted a offer at Synopsys. I dropped off the FedEx, um, dropped off the acceptance letter at FedEx. And after my sister, 
use some choice words. To me, I drove back to FedEx on Front Street, um, collected a package, and told the Google recruiter that I'll, I'll join Google. And so that's kind of like a synopsis of my path from Jamaica all the way to Santa Cruz, all the way to Google, which is where I am right now. So the, the focus of my talk is not necessarily about my specific path, but it's about the difficulties that you encounter um, on that path. And so being a minority is not necessarily a very difficult thing, but as many of you guys know, um, people that look like me um, are generally oppressed in this country. And this is something that you don't necessarily know until you are living in this country. And so the majority of my talk is going to really be about the ways of those oppressions um, affect you in your academic and your professional career and what we can do hopefully in the future to make this not be an issue. And so I'm going to bring it all the way back to college to an incident that happened um, when I was a sophomore in college. So I, this was the spring semester of my sophomore year. Um, some students were on campus during the winter break and at Harvey Mudd, there are different dorms. Different dorms have different cultures. One of the dorms had a culture of burning items. And so there are a couple people from a sports team that were on campus during the winter and they were getting bored. So they thought they liked to burn something. Um, a student from Pomona, which is a part of the consortium at, uh, in the Claremont College, so Harvey Mudd is a part of a consortium of five colleges, Pomona, Scripps, um, Claremont McKenna, Pizza and Harvey Mudd. And so a student at Pomona, which is one of the other colleges in the consortium, had made a cross um, for as a piece of artwork. And so the students thought it'd be, this was like, they thought it was garbage. So it's like, oh, well, this is something that we could burn. And so they proceeded to burn the cross on, um, on Harvey Mudd, at Harvey Mudd at the dorm. And the next day, a facilities and maintenance worker came by and saw an outline of a burnt cross on the ground. And clearly, it was a whole incident. Um, and for me, it was, it was a little bit strange because I moved into the US. I thought that in general, California, especially on, at liberal arts schools, Religion didn't seem to be such a, a big deal. So I was like, is this, is this some sacrilegious um, thing why it became such a, a big thing? And it kind of was the rude awakening of, um, oh, of, uh, of what life was going to be like in, in, um, in the States. Because because of that incident, I learned a lot and I had to learn a lot really quickly of what it meant to be black in America, because the incident opened a lot of wounds, as you guys could probably imagine. And for me, it was very, I was like, I didn't really know what I was getting myself into when I decided to come to the States, but it quickly showed me a lot of what it meant to be black in America. And so some of the things that I learned in from that incident in, in college was, uh, before, I didn't know what the Jim Crow laws were. I didn't know what the civil rights movement really was. I mean, you kind of know Martin Luther King, Martin Luther King Day, et cetera, but the implications on what it really meant is, is still not very apparent to you as someone who lives in a foreign country. I also learned who Emmett Till was. Um, Emmett Till, for those who don't know, was a, um, was a young person from Chicago who visited some family in the South and was murdered because he thought he would be bold enough to speak to a white um, shop owner. Um, and so when all this was happening, it was like very, to be, to be honest, a little bit frightening because it's like, whoa, this, this is not necessarily something that happened hundreds of years ago. This is something that happened literally less than 50 years ago. And so it was a very, I guess, um, hard time just coming to, to the realization of what it meant to be black in America. Um, I learned what redlining was and I learned what the three fifths compromise was. And so there, there are many things I also learned that I just nearly enumerated in the slide, but 
there was a, a lot of things that were happening on campus at that point. And it kind of opened my eyes to even things that previously happened when I started at Harvey Mudd that now made a lot more sense to me. And so essentially the um, one thing that, that became apparent from all this, this stuff that happened on campus was that people of color, people that look like me were always treated as inferior. And this, this manifests itself in the academic world and also manifests itself in the professional world. Um, one thing, one of the ways this manifests even initially when I, I joined is that um, there are always these rumors that like the only reason why the black students are having what got in was because of their color, they weren't necessarily good enough. Um, and this was always strange to me coming from Jamaica because at no point in my life have I ever been my, my ability has ever been questioned because of how I look, right? And so it was strange that people who have never met me before automatically assumed that I was just not good enough to be there. Um, in the end, I graduated with 3.7 GPA highest honors. And so it's kind of strange that someone would make the assumption that like, oh, just because this person looks different, um, that they weren't good enough. But in reality, this, this happens over and over again in, in college, in grad school, in, in the working world where people automatically just assume that you're less than just based on your code. Um, another, another way this manifests in, in school is I had a very, I had a Kenyan friend, um, so he's an international student like me, and he would always be asked to show ID while on campus, which is kind of strange because there are probably like five, six of us. So you, at, at that point, you should know all the black people. It's not like this campus security are changing every day. Um, and so it's, it's one of those things where people question like, are you, are you really supposed to be here? Um, where that necessarily wouldn't happen to other minorities. Um, one way this manifests itself at work is uh, we're constantly asked to, to check for, um, for tailgaters. So basically people that, um, so once you badge in, you should not let anyone just follow you in because they could not be an employee. A lot of times what happens is because the campuses are very open, people just walk in off the street and come in and steal equipment, et cetera. And with what happened with this tailgater check-in um, is that black employees or people like me were aggressively targeted by other coworkers. I even had a person, had an incident personally where someone asked me to show a badge when I was walking into a lobby and lobbies are public spaces. So it's, it's kind of those, one of those things where because of your appearance, people all automatically assume that you don't belong there, which is unfortunate because this leads to imposter syndrome and, and all the things that come along with that. But ever since that um, cross burning incident in college, I recognize that people in the States would always view me as less than. Um, another story I can tell is uh, David Drummond, who was a chief counsel at Google until recently. Um, he was on a board of Uber and he was attending a, a board meeting and the security wouldn't let him go to the board meeting because they didn't think he was on the board. Um, so there are all these little, uh, the, the word they use today are microaggressions that are carried out to people of color and potential other minorities, but I'll be focusing on, on my minority because I have, I have more experience in that, um, where people will always treat you or not necessarily always treat you less than, but potentially will treat you less than because of the color of your skin. Um, And then how does this manifest in the real world? Um, so there, this is not necessarily a, a, a color thing, but uh, a couple of years ago, there was a, a Google um, or ex-Google calls James or more that wrote a manifesto about why women was not, were not as good at um, the sciences as men, as, at STEM as men. Um, and so there are always, people that will always question your ability in certain situations. And this will happen in the workplace, this will happen at school, um, et cetera, which is unfortunate because it's, it's difficult due to historical reasons um, and the wealth gap for a lot of minorities to even get to certain places. And the last thing you really need is to have imposter syndrome 
when you actually make it to that place. Um, and then I guess also more um, pertinent to what's happening today. So yesterday was the um, anniversary of the Joy Floyd killing. So last year, May 25th, 2020, um, everyone probably should know George Floyd was murdered by police in Minneapolis. Um, and so this is just like another example where essentially because of the color of your skin, you're treated as less than someone else person. Um, and in, in Jamaica, you don't necessarily have to worry about interactions with police, um, but that's something I had to quickly learn was important existing in the States, right? Where a simple police stop could be like your, your last interaction in this world. Um, and so that's one way where this, uh, this treatment of being a person of color where you get treated less than. Um, another way that you get treated less than is that you're valued less than. So one thing that is, um, I guess, probably pop up in the news right now is that people of color usually get lower valuations on their homes than people of non-color. And the way people prove this is that they would get a valuation appraisal. Um, I guess is the term they use in the States. And it's a very low appraisal given comparable um, homes in the area. They remove all things that are white, I mean, or all things that are black from their home. So the pictures and they get like a friend that's a Caucasian to stand in and they get a new appraisal and the appraisal is much larger. And you think that this probably wouldn't be happening even in, in uh, I would say the Bay Area because people might see the Bay Area as well. But recently this happened in, um, in San Jose where someone got an appraisal and it was low, they got their friend to stand in for them and the appraisal was 500K higher. Um, so I've actually had personal experience with this where I have tried to do a re refinance. Um, I got an appraisal and it was very low compared to other properties. And I was, I was wondering what was going on and I did just some research and I was like, oh, this is a thing where you get a lower appraisal as a black person. So coming from Jamaica, that's something that you necessarily would think about um, because in Jamaica or Malta is also many one people. So we generally don't treat people differently based on their ethnicity, but in the States, this is like a running theme. Um, another way where um, you get treated worse as a minority is um, in the healthcare system. This is well known. If you look at the mortality rate from COVID-19 and the current pandemic, you'd see that it disproportionately affects people of color. Um, if you look at the infant, infant mortality rate across all ethnicities, you can see that people of color have worse infant, infant mortality rate. And you could say that's because of worse healthcare and there could be many reasons, but I mean, as Serena Williams showed, Serena Williams is the greatest tennis player of all time. And she also got substantial um, healthcare as a mother. Um, where she was telling a doctor, oh, I am having these clots and the doctor kind of was like nonchalant about it. And her, her husband actually had to be like very firm in that situation to make sure that his wife was living. Um, and so there's, there are all these different situations. I mean, I'm getting to highlight a couple more where you can see that as a person of color, you're treated differently, not only in a professional space, but like in a general, in the general world. Um, another, another way this happens is the prison industrial complex where you see that, um, I mean, America has a large prison population in general compared to, as a percentage compared to the majority of the world or I'd say first world countries. But even amongst that large prison po population, you see that a large percentage are people of color, people that look like me. And there are several reasons for this. I mean, one of the major reasons is that people of color get longer sentences for similar crimes as people that are not of color. Um, and so it's just another manifestation of how as a person of color in the States that you're treated less than other minorities and the majority. Um, but 
it, it's not necessarily all doom and gloom because we can we can change how how um how we're treated in academic environments and professional environments in the real world. And one way to to effect this change is you kind of want to normalize people of color being in certain situations. Um, that's one of the reasons I actually decided to do this talk. I actually hate public speaking, but because I recognize that my voice has the ability to change um, perceptions to improve the treatment of people of color in the States, I decided to do this talk because I'm very nervous in public speaking, but I decided that like, I need to be that voice to put the change so that all, everyone can be treated equal. Um, that's the re reason why I'm a trustee or a former trustee at Harvard College, my term ended in May. Um, but I wanted to give the impression to the uh, young students of Harvard College that like it's, it's normal for someone of color to be in a position of leadership, to be in a position where you're directing um, the future of a school. And it's, it's not unusual. Um, it's people of color can do this. It's not uh, unnatural, it's not beyond our abilities. Um, that's also one of the major reasons I decided to teach at UCSC. Um, it's a lot of work having a full-time job and also teaching students, but it was important to me to, to show that A, you can be a person of color and be successful in STEM it can be a person of color and be able to teach them to show that you have a large knowledge of it. And so it's not, STEM is not beyond um, the abilities of people of color. In my first class at UCSC, I had a student who was like, I'm from Jamaica, never in my wildest dreams. They ever expect to have a Jamaican teacher at UCSC. And for me, that kind of just made the whole experience worth it because I was able to be a positive image um, I mean, some might disagree based on what happened across the two semesters, but in general, a positive image for, for students, not necessarily of color, but of, of everyone so that people can be normalized to the concept of like, oh, a person of color in STEM is not unusual. It's not beyond their abilities. Um, it's a reason I do career fairs. It's also for the same reason. I kind of want to normalize the concept that you can be a person of color and you can be a senior software engineer software engineer at Google, it's not unusual. Um, every, we have the ability to do it and it should just be not really thought of like, oh, this person got to this position because they had to get help, whether through some policies like um, affirmative action or they had to lower the bar because that's one thing that, they, that always comes up at Google is that like, oh, are we lowering the bar for these diversity highs? And they use all these very, I would say offensive terms like diversity highs, as in like, it's not just a normal higher, it's like a special higher because you're just not good enough. Um, and yeah, so that's, it's, it's more about representation so that people can be um, normalized to the fact that it's not unusual to be, to see people in certain spaces. Um, so as you guys, the students in this talk, I mean, listen to this talk, go to the working world, you should try to always do your best to, to push the envelope in terms of normalizing what people expect of people that look like you. Um, Obama, I think, did this tremendously. When I came to the States, people were always talking about, like, will I ever live to see a Black president? For me, it was kind of different because not only do we have Black, president, black prime ministers, we have, like, a very a slightly different government uh, model. Um, Westminster, like, because we're a former U U UK colony, so we, a lot of things we do are pretty similar to do to England. Um, we had a black prime minister, we also had a female prime minister. So for a black female prime minister, for, for me, the concept of a black president was like, oh, why not? Like it's, it's, it's normal, right? But for a lot of people, it was like a pipe dream. And so I think what happened when Obama became president it made a lot of younger people in pre, a lot of the younger generation to think it was normal for there to be a black president. Whereas older generations, the people that I interacted with when I first came to the States was like, oh, this is this holy grail that will, will it ever be achieved? And so I think by having representation, you kind of normalize the concept of like, oh, this is not beyond us. This is not 
un, um, abnormal. And now we not only do we have a we had a black president, we have a black female president, and that's kind of like what by Obama, in my opinion, pushing the boundary of like, oh, it's okay to be an ethnic minority and be in the position of the highest vote in this country. It's not okay for um, Biden or Honorable Biden to select a, a black female vice president. It kind of by normal by putting yourself in these positions, you are normalizing to everyone that like it's okay for minorities and minorities are good enough to do this and they're not less than everyone else. Um, and then there are other ways that we can uh, effect change. So if we can't normalize the, the concept of that, that everyone is, is equal, we can implement rules to make it um, harder for people to be discriminated against or to be people, people to be treated less than. Um, one thing that they've done to tackle police brutality is body cameras on police. Um, there are other things, there's like a Rooney rule in football. Um, there, there are many things, um, this is since this is more about uh, a uh, education, academic thing, I won't really talk about ways we can try to change injustice against minorities in the States, but essentially what I want to, what people to get from this talk was going from a majority to a minority was difficult, not because I missed the companionship of people that look like me, but because of people treating me as less than other people in the process. Um, I was able to overcome it and hopefully with time that becomes less of an issue. And with time, let's try to make it so that that becomes less of an issue by normalizing people of color excellence in academic and professional settings. Um, that's my talk and I'm open for questions. Great, thank you so much, Sheldon. Um, we have a, actually a bunch of really great questions came in. Um, so I'll just get started. Uh, the first one is, what are some of the ways that leaders in tech and higher ed can com combat the kinds of microaggressions you talked about? Have you seen any actions that have been particularly effective? Um, I think one of the things that at Google we've tried to do is unbiased training. Um, so, a lot of the times these things are very subconscious um, in that they people don't necessarily think that they're doing it. It's just something that just happens automatically. Uh, and so what we try to do is to to these um, unconscious bias um, training so that we can get rid of those unconscious biases that exist where a lot of those are that like, oh, people of color, minorities are in free. And so once we know that our biases exist and we, we can try to address them. So I think it's not a very simple task because over time, a lot of this is kind of like imprinted in, in, in people's minds. It's not necessarily innate, it's learned. And so it's a lot of the way me, the media portrayals, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so resolving unconscious biases are hard, but if you know that they exist, at least you can try to look out for them and not try to um, act on them or have them act out straight like this, like that. So I think that's one thing that people have done a lot is unconscious bias training. Great, that's good to hear. Um, can you talk about your experience mentoring students Oh, yeah, that's something I was actually get to talk about. That's that's another way you can um, try to fight this uh, this uh, implicit bias against people of color is that I, I have um, mentored some interns. I did also do some mentoring. So at Google, they have like uh, some internships and then you have your intern host, which is a person that handles the products, but then you can also have your mentors and so I always participate in our program because I think it's a good way to a, have a, um, a space for people to feel comfortable because a lot of times, because of lots of the things I've spoke about, 
people of color go into these situations with imposter syndrome. And so it's a good way to allow people to feel a lot more comfortable. And when you're comfortable, you do your best work. Um, and so I always mentor at least two or three interns um, a summer when the office was open, granted. There's no office open last year and this year, so I won't be doing that. But I think it's important to mentor the next generation. I mentor students that are having mud. Um, I haven't really done mentorship at UCSC, so it's maybe something I could change, but I'm always open to trying to provide a, um, to give advice or to just talk to general, talk to people in general about just being in, in this environment and the challenges. Uh, I mentor some, some people from back home in Jamaica, et cetera. So I think it's always important to help the next generation um, so that at some point in the near future, just like how having a black person was a pipe dream, we can be in a world where no one really doubts your ability because of the way you look. Great. Um, on the same topic, do you have any advice for students who are being mentored um, so that they can really take advantage of the benefits of the mentorship? Um, so that's like a, a much harder question to answer. I think the one of the things I've, I've recognized is that a lot of people don't necessarily know what they want. A lot of people generally just kind of trying to follow a formula of life. And I think if you know what you want, then the mentorship experience is pretty useful because then you can ask the right questions. I think what makes it difficult in some mentor-mentee relationships is that people don't necessarily know what they want from situation like a lot of people are like oh I, I kind of want a job in tech I don't really know what type of job I want but I know it's a stable job so I'm kind of going through the emotions um, and so I don't think that having a mentor is good to help you in that situation because you don't really necessarily know what you want but if you know what you want do you know the right question to ask and you can also pick your mentor in a way so that you can get to the to the place that you want to be so it's more about knowing what you want, and then that way you can ask the right questions. So it's it's a little bit difficult to answer, but yeah. Great, I think that was helpful. Um, so you mentioned that UCSC has a pretty relatively small percentage of uh, black students. How can UCSC educators help students who are experiencing post imposter syndrome? And how can students and tech professionals recognize and overcome their own imposter syndrome? Okay, um, I think, I think at, at some point, um, so it's not easy, right? Because if you've been told all your life that you're not good enough, when you actually get there, then you always get to think you're not good enough. Um, I think it was slightly easier for me because for the first 18 years of my life, I've never really been told I was, never, was not good enough. Um, I did have some imposter syndrome when I, just started Harvey Mudd and when I guess I just started Google, but at some point you need to recognize that like, oh, I belong. And for some people it might take two weeks, some people might take a year, but at some point you hopefully will get to that point where you realize you belong and you're good enough and you should be there. Um, I think one way to, to get, I don't, I'm not Angel I sure what's the best way to get to that point. Um, mm -hmm. But I think it's more, a lot of it, in my opinion, is confidence. And so you want to build up your self-confidence and knowing that like what you're doing is right. Um, and I think it's probably more a stronger onus on the people that are in power for you to, to kind of guide you along that path to, to let you know that like, oh, what you're doing is good. You're, you're more than good enough to be here. Um, and I think I, I've seen in situations where people that have the power to kind of give people that push to remove that imposter syndrome, go the opposite way and kind of try and re trying to reinforce it. Um, and so I think it's, there's the onus on the, the person to try to get that confidence, but I think the onus is more on people in power to try to push you to have that confidence to know that you're like, oh, you're, you're, you're here. Um, so I think with respect to like faculty and staff, it's kind of more just having 
good words of reinforcement to the student to be like, oh, it's okay. It's it's not you you're you're good enough. Like you don't have to worry that like you got in by some magic or some fluke. You, once you're here, you're you're good enough to be here. Believe it. And hopefully with time that student will believe it and have that imposter syndrome like removed. Did you have any faculty that were uh, were those people for you? Um, no, but as again, as I said before, like it was, I think it's slightly different for me being from a majority. So I, I actually never really, as if people that know me wouldn't think that confidence is an issue for me. Let's just leave it at that. So, but I mean, I can, I can see in, in other people that like, they have that, they don't have that necessarily like, oh, I believe that like, oh, I can do this. So, but I think with time, people will generate that belief. It okay. might take some people longer. Great. Um, okay, another question. I have a couple more questions. Um, language is so important. You mentioned the term diversity hires as being especially offensive. Is there other problematic language that you notice in the workplace that you think that people should be aware of? Um, I mean, I think any language that makes it seem that you are a special case um because in a in a bad way because if you're special in a good way then everyone mm -hmm. probably would love that but there's a there's a lot of language that people will use that will kind of imply that like oh you're less than and you're only here because of like a special boost mm -hmm. um i can't enumerate all of them but um diversity highs is something that came to my head right right away um but but yeah there's there's stuff I mean, people usually when they mention aversive action, it's in a negative way. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's just all those words where people are just trying to imply that you're not really good enough to be here and you wouldn't be here if you didn't get outside help. Um, it, it happens all the time, unfortunately, but it's, it's, a, it's the US that we live in today. Great, thank you. Um, these last two are for uh, specifically for undergrads. Uh, what advice would you give students who are trying to pursue a graduate degree in engineering? Um, I mean, I think there are lots of programs that try to help people on, along the way. I think Matthew, with us, there's this, um, I actually don't know it off the top of my head, but there, there, there are avenues that you can go for help. I think one of the things that I've recognized here is all, people don't generally ask for help. Um, and there are all these resources at, at university to help you along your path. There are career services, there are advising, there are different types of advising that you can do. So I think to get to grad school, I would ask for help. I'd also find someone that has done it before. So you can get like, or many people have done it before because different people have different paths. Kind of gets a sense of like, what's the path to go from undergrad to grad school, what you need to be doing. Um, so, for example, if you want to work, you probably want to do internships in the summer. If you want to go to grad school, you might want to do research in the summer. And so there, there are different, there are things that you can do along the way in your undergraduate path to get you to, to grad school. Um, and so I think it's more about being educated, knowing what, what you have to do to get there. And there are a lot of advising. I mean, all your professors have been to graduate school or the majority of them, mm -hmm. I'd say. And so if that's like the first step is like, you know, you can talk to your professor. Don't be afraid to talk to someone. Um, most professors are more than willing to help students. And so that's just, just try to get as much information you can about the process so that when you're a senior, you're not like, oh, I didn't do this, I didn't do that, et cetera, et cetera. Great, yeah, that's good advice. Um, have you ever had to advocate for yourself or stand up for yourself in a work environment that is mainly non people of color who are not sensitive to your struggles? If yes, how did you do so? Um, ooh, that's a good question. Um, so I think in general, most people might get to be sensitive to these struggles because especially when there are all these incidents, these riots, um, no one really talks about it at work because if 1% of the population is black, for a lot of people, that doesn't really affect them, right? Um, I have a coworker whose last name is Lynch. 
um, and actually joked about, I mean, even appropriate joke about um, his last name and a lot of people, a lot of my coworkers didn't even know what lynching was. Um, so in reality, most people in the work environment, because you're a minority, won't know about your struggle. And I think I've never really been in a situation where I would say that I had to advocate for my ethnicity. Um, but what I usually try to do is all of the, the um, like there's a group on campus called Black Google Network, there are all these events. Um, anything, if they're like, uh, a lot of times students will come onto campus, if there's anything where I can try to be a positive voice um, for black tech workers, I always try to do it to make sure that all the students, all the young people can see, okay, I can actually do this. Like he can do it, I can do it kind of type of stuff. Um, if you had to, to advocate for yourself, um, I'd say do it carefully. Make sure you probably go to the right channels because there are lots of high profile incidents. Um, if you think about T. Myth, um, I can't pronounce her last name. Um, who was the Google machine learning expert um, and how that ended up for her. Um, you kind of just want to make sure you dot your I's and cross all the T's because as you can see, a lot of times you're more than expendable, especially because you get to be treated less than. Um, but I'd say just do it carefully. Um, and if you need, I'd also, make sure you can get some people at our director level above on your side before moving forward. Great, thank you. Um, okay, I have one more question. Um, you were involved in ACM and IEEE and got a Nesby scholarship. Do you think it's important for students to participate in student orgs? If so, what benefits did you get from participation? Um, so this is good to be a very roundabout answer. And I think, especially in my experience with teaching, like everyone kind of wants um, a very quantifiable reward for doing an action. Um, and in life, there's always like positive externalities that you can do some, they're always unknown unknowns. Um, so by doing something, it might have a positive effect that you can't really quantify in that moment. Um, so I don't think you should really like, oh, should I do this because it has a positive, it has a like a directly quantifiable effect in improving the quality of my life. The reason why I'm a part of IEEE and ACM is because I believe in those institutions and by supporting them through my fees, I'm helping these institutions carry on. Um, they produce magazines, I don't necessarily read them, but I think other people do. And so it's more about like contributing. It's more like a um, something I do, not necessarily for the benefit of me, but for the benefit of the other people that use it. So it's more like a, um, a contribution to society. And I think Nesby is good. It's a good way to network with people. A lot of times in life, the way you get jobs is not necessarily through your resume, but through your network. And so I think even IEEE, ACM, those are also good networking opportunities. And so where you might do something and you might not see the immediate returns on your investment, um, I think it's still good to be a part of these, these, um, these institutions for other reasons, because you never know why, why it might be helpful. Um, which, so that's the reason why I've been a part of NSB. I even tried to help NSB start a chapter at UCSC. I'm not entirely sure what the status of that is, but I think it's critical to just be a part of these groups because at the end of the day, we're social creatures, no man is an island. And so I think it's pretty important just to make sure these institutions keep on going. Great, thank you. Um, if anyone, uh, I, I think that's the only question, the last question. Um, I don't know if Carmen or Abigail has any questions. I don't think so. Carmen? I don't think so. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Sheldon, for um, participating in Diverse Voices. We um, enjoyed your talk and we will uh, be sharing this recording with students for um, years to come.
Right, and be before wait, before you log off, Sheldon, I just need to say one other thing. Um, uh, first, thank you again for this very interesting, very honest, and frankly, very sobering presentation. Um, we appreciate your service to your PhD alma mater, um, both as a speaker in diverse voices and as an educator for our students. And I wanted to share with you a message from your PhD advisor, Matt Goodhaus, or maybe it's not a message to you. It's just a message to all of us. Um, Matt Goodhaus, who is a professor of computer science and engineering and also our associate dean for um, graduate studies, um, let me know that it was a great experience working with Sheldon. He was one of uh, Matt's first PhD students. He was a top student academically, and Matt had the opportunity, Sheldon, to see you grow as a researcher and a professional. Um, he also very much respects your appreciation of travel, photography, chess, uh, and so on. And he jokes that he was very gratified when he beat you at words with friends a couple times. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> some words from your PhD advisor. And, and Sheldon, thank you so much. And to our audience, thank you so much for participating or for, being, for attending um, our season finale of Diverse Voices. Thank you. All right, bye. Thanks, everyone. Good night.